Seeing stubbornness in themselves, intelligent people recognize stubbornness. Seeing gloom, they recognize gloom. Seeing delusion, they recognize that, too. They look for their own faults. They don't try to fault other people. Intersecting Karmic Paths Mechi Gao redoubled her efforts. She always started her meditation with a resolve to redirect her focus inward and hold it there, to fix it in her heart. But focusing inward for Mechi Gao meant going into a mental freefall. As soon as she closed her eyes, the bottom dropped away, and she felt herself falling into space as though she were falling from a cliff or down into a well. Fragmented images flashed by for a few moments, and then utter stillness, calm, contentment. But hidden beneath this stillness was an almost reflexive momentum that soon rebounded her flow of consciousness back into the realm of fragmented imagery. Suspended in this fluid mental space, Machi Gao felt right at home. She had learned to navigate its mysterious passageways with ease. Following a flash of recognition, a presence, an emotion, a disembodied consciousness, she plunged into another world, the myriad realms of sentient existence. Her desire to understand the truth drove her to observe newer heights and depths of samsaric being. Constantly observant, she noticed celestial forms, their means of dialogue, and their habits, customs, and beliefs. Sharply focusing her divine eye, she probed the spiritual universe for insight or clues that might help her discover the truth of the Buddha's teaching. Again, she was falling victim to the outward tendency of her conscious mind. As she struggled on her own to deepen her meditation, Machi Gao was unaware that one of Ajahn Mun's close disciples had just then reached the final stage of realizing the truth of Tamma, and that their karmic paths would soon intersect. Ajahn Mahabua Nyarna Sampanno headed into the Pupan Mountains following Ajahn Mun's cremation. Several days of hiking brought him to Wat Doi Tamma Chedi, Ajahn Gongma's mountain retreat where, several years earlier, Mechi Gao had struggled so spiritedly with her stubborn temperament. A consummate spiritual warrior, Ajahn Mahabua, attacked the defilements of his mind as though they were a mortal enemy, accepting nothing short of their utter capitulation. For years his meditation had resembled all-out war, each seated session like hand-to-hand -hand combat, each walking session a life-or-death struggle. One by one, his inner adversaries were beaten into retreat, no mercy given, no prisoners taken. Still, he pursued them relentlessly, searching for the hidden source of their power. Beginning with the most obstructive and obvious mental defilements, the foot soldiers, he cleared a path and battled his way through until he reached the elite troops, the subtler and more cunning deceptions that encircled and protected their elusive commander, the fundamental delusion about his mind's true essence. The primal delusion that mobilizes the forces of greed and anger is always cunningly concealed in the deepest recess of the heart. Being the chief ruler of the entire samsaric realm, delusion is defended to the death by its formidable army of mental defilements. To liberate the mind from its scourge, these guardians must be disarmed and stripped of their deceptive power. To breach the ramparts of his own fundamental delusion, Ajahn Mahabua rallied his own supreme forces, mindfulness and wisdom and lay siege to delusions in her sanctum. Confronting the defenses with mindfulness and disabling them with wisdom, his forces methodically closed in on the enemy's stronghold. When all the mental defilements were finally eliminated, the last one left in the heart was the great commander, the underlying delusion that creates and perpetuates the cycle of birth and death. The final assault had begun. With a lightning strike of extraordinary power and brilliance, the last vestiges of delusion were destroyed, causing the entire edifice of samsaric existence to collapse and disintegrate, leaving the mind's true essence absolutely pure and free of all defilement. Another fully enlightened arahant had arisen in the world. In that same year, following the annual rains retreat, Mechi Gao's meditation was witness to a prophetic vision of the moon and its surrounding stars falling from the sky. She interpreted the vision to mean that an exceptional meditation teacher, followed by a group of gifted disciples, would soon arrive at Ban Hui Sai. She became very excited, convinced by the nature of her vision that this monk would be the meditation teacher a John Mun told her about many years before. 
Mechi Gao confidently informed the other nuns that the coming year would see the arrival of a group of Tutanga monks, led by a great meditation master. She did not yet know who the monk was, but she had perceived an unmistakable sign. She compared his coming to the time a John Mun brought a group of monks to Ban Hui Sai when she was a young girl. In the following months, just as she predicted, several groups of Tutanga monks came and went. With hope and anticipation, Miachi Gao walked to their forest encampment to greet them and pay her respects. But each time she left disappointed, certain that they were not the monks represented in her vision. In January 1951, a John Mahapua wandered down from the Pupan Mountains, leading a group of Tutanga monks. They camped in the thickly wooded foothills to the north of Ban Hue Sai. They camped under trees, in caves, on mountain ridges, and under overhanging cliffs, living simply and practicing meditation in the traditional Tutanga fashion. Ajahn Mahapua chose to stay in a cave on the gently sloping crest of a mountain ridge, well over a mile from the village center. He took residence in Nokan Cave, with a lone novice as his attendant. Nokan Cave was a long, broad cavern that nestled snugly under a prominent overhanging cliff, and was paved at its entrance with flat, outspreading rocks. The living quarters were cool and well-ventilated, and the environment radiated natural peace and harmony. When news of Ajahn Mahabua's arrival reached her, Machi Gao led several nuns up a steep and winding mountain trail to meet him. The high ground at the ridge's peak flattened into outcrops of black sandstone that followed the undulating contours of the ground to the cave's entrance. Approaching the entrance, Machi Gao spotted Ajahn Mahabua seated on a flat boulder just outside. Barely able to contain her delight, she quickly turned and with a joyful smile whispered, That's him! That's the great meditation master I told you about! Cautiously, with gestures of respect, the nuns drew near Ajahn Mahabua. They dropped to their knees in front of his seat and gracefully prostrated three times. After exchanging pleasantries with him, Mechi Gao mentioned that long ago, when she was still a girl, she had met Ajahn Mun. She described in detail the scene from her childhood, recounting how Ajahn Mun taught her meditation, and how he later forbade her to meditate in his absence. Out of deep respect for Ajahn Mun, she had foregone any attempts at meditation for many years. It was only after she had become a nun that she started meditating again in earnest. As a close disciple of Ajahn Mun, Ajahn Mahabua was puzzled. Why would Ajahn Mun have forbidden her to meditate? As soon as she told Ajahn Mahabua about her prolific visions, he quickly realized the reason. When she met Ajahn Mahabua, Manchi Gao had been deeply engrossed in encountering strange and unusual phenomena during her samadhi meditation for more than ten years. If she failed to see visions, she believed she gained little benefit from meditation. Being wholly addicted to these spiritual adventures, she had convinced herself that they represented the true path to Nibbana and to the end of all suffering. At once, John Mahabua recognized her fundamental mistake. Without a highly skilled meditation teacher to restrain her excesses, she was easily led by her venturesome and dynamic mind to misinterpret her experiences and misdirect her efforts towards a false goal. But he also knew that someone with a powerful mind like hers could progress very quickly in Tamma once she learned to properly train her mind. Ajahn Mahabua realized that, like Ajahn Man, Mechi Gao would be able to use her unusual abilities in profound and amazing ways to free herself from suffering and to help other living beings do the same. From that time on, Mechi Gao regularly visited Ajahn Mahabua at his mountain retreat. Once a week, late in the afternoon on lunar observance days, she and the nuns of Ban Hui Sai ascended the winding mountain trail to pay their respects to Ajahn Mahabua and then to hear him deliver an inspirational discourse on Tamma. When he finished, he asked the nuns about their meditation. Every time Ajahn Mahabua questioned Machi Gao, she spoke only of the extraordinary phenomena, the variety of ghosts and disembodied spirits she encountered. Her extensive travels in the heaven and hell realms gave her first-hand knowledge of the various beings that lived there. She described the ghosts' mental states and life circumstances in detail, and how their previous gamma resulted in their birth to these realms. It was apparent that Mechi Gao was captivated by these strange visions and the unusual knowledge they revealed. This worried Ajahn Mahabua. He was astonished by her extraordinary psychic abilities, but realized that she did not yet have sufficient control over her mind to meditate safely on her own. Instead of sending her attention out to perceive external phenomena, he wanted her to learn how to keep it firmly focused within her own body and mind. 
Only by keeping her awareness firmly centered inside could she overcome the mental defilements that were preventing her from taking her meditation to a higher level. Ajahn Mahabua explained that the initial aim of meditation is to develop right samadhi. To practice samadhi correctly, she had to relinquish her obsession with thoughts and images that entered her awareness. She had to free the mind from the unnecessary limitations caused by being habitually focused on the contents of thought and imagination. Through the right practice of samadhi, she could directly experience the mind's essential knowing nature, which would allow her to examine physical and mental phenomena with detached objectivity. The mind's knowing essence is an awareness more vast than the perception of images, thoughts, and feelings. It is an unobstructed inner space that contains everything, but retains nothing. Once this power of mental awakening is developed, it can be renewed and deepened without limit. Before that breakthrough occurs, overattention to external phenomena distracts from the primary purpose, reaching the source of awareness itself. In the beginning, Ajahn Mahabua simply listened as Mayachi Gao related her unusual adventures. He carefully gauged the conditions of her mind's spiritual energy, and then gently tried to persuade her to redirect the flow of her conscious awareness inward to its original source. He repeated that consciousness is a function of mind, not the essence of mind. She must let go of consciousness and its conditioned awareness to let the mind's true essence shine forth. When Ajahn Mahabua noticed after several weeks that she was ignoring his advice, he insisted that she keep her mental focus entirely inside for some of the time during meditation. She could still direct her awareness to observe external phenomena from time to time, but she must also force it to stay at home at other times. He urged her to learn how to control her mind so that she would be able to direct the flow of consciousness either inward or outward as she wished. Because her visions involved contact with the mind's internal sense fields, Mechi Gao viewed them as being explorations of her own mind. She believed that by investigating the phenomena arising in her samadhi meditation, she could learn the truth about the conscious awareness that perceived them. Stubbornly set in her ways and reluctant to alter her approach, she began openly resisting Ajahn Mahabhu's teaching, arguing that her meditation was already providing her with knowledge and insight of a profound nature. She saw no reason to change. Ajahn Mahabhua patiently explained that the phenomena she witnessed were merely things that existed naturally in the universe. They were no more special than things seen with open eyes. Although the worlds that appeared in her spiritual visions were realms of being just as real and distinctive as the human realm, they were also just as external to the awareness that perceived them. Though not solid and tangible like material objects of perception, they were still separate from the awareness that knew them. Essentially, from the observer's viewpoint, there was no difference between physical objects and spiritual ones. All were objects in the external world. He wanted her to reverse the direction of her focus, halting the outward flow of consciousness and turning inwards to realize the true essence of mind, the very source of awareness itself. Mechi Gao continually countered that, unlike the physical eye, the inner eye could see unusually strange and wonderful things. The inner eye was capable of seeing many varieties of ghosts and other disembodied beings. It could see and interact with devas in all the heavenly realms. It could see past life connections and accurately foresee future events. She maintained that this sort of knowledge and vision was superior to that perceivable by the ordinary senses. Ajahn Mahabua did not tolerate stubbornness indefinitely. Abruptly changing tack, he demanded, with a powerful and vigorous insistence, that she prevent her mind from venturing out to perceive spiritual phenomena. Such misdirected awareness would never help her overcome the fundamental causes of birth, aging, sickness, and death. He reminded her that he was teaching her this for her own good, and he made it clear that he expected his instructions to be obeyed. Ajahn Mahabua's admonition notwithstanding, Mechi Gao felt so confident of her own knowledge and understanding that she continued meditating as before, and later argued with him again about its true value. Exasperated and thoroughly weary of her intransigence, Ajahn Mahabua became fierce. He raised his voice and gestured forcefully as he forbade her to direct her awareness outward to encounter external phenomena. In no uncertain terms, he ordered her to reverse the direction of her focus and keep it centered inside at all times. He was uncompromising. Only by accepting his teaching and practicing it diligently could she eliminate the defiling elements that deluded her mind. Late one afternoon, as Mechi Gao stubbornly continued to argue her case, 
Ajahn Mahabua abruptly broke the conversation off and curtly dismissed her from his presence. He told her point-blank to leave the cave immediately and to never return. Uttering harsh and fiery words, he chased her off in front of the other nuns. Mechigao was taken aback by the intensity of his verbal attack and the seriousness of his tone. Such an outcome had never occurred to her. Mechigao left Ajahn Mahabua's cave in tears, feeling utterly devastated, her confidence shattered. With his stern reprimand still ringing in her ears, she made the long trek back to the nunnery, feeling that she would never see him again. Despondently, Mei Gao trudged down the steep mountain path, gripped by her dilemma. She had been convinced from the first moment she saw Ajahn Mahabua that she could depend on him as the right teacher to guide her meditation. Now that he had unceremoniously chased her away, who could she depend on for expert guidance? After so many years of searching for a teacher, Mechi Gao now felt hopelessly lost.